Hi, sophomores. We are obviously doing things a little differently at this point, and I will say that most likely it's going to be as much a learning experience for me as for you. Um, so please do your best to keep up with what's going on as best as you're able to, and um, I will do my best to make this process as seamless as possible. Um, it's a little unfortunate that we can't all be in the same room reading this together because I think that's definitely one of the highlights of every year. But I will try to figure out a way to make Google Hangouts work for us perhaps during a reading and either way um, still make the play enjoyable for you. So what I'm going to do to kind of simulate what we were doing in class is play a bit of audio, have the text pulled up on the screen, and then as you're probably already guessing, stopping about every five lines and explaining um, to the best of my ability what's going on. I want to at some point um, be able to maybe have you guys jump in on this conversation and upload your own audio or do a Google Hangout where I can actually ask you the questions rather than just kind of giving you what I think is going on and you saying, oh yes, Mr. Ling, that's clearly what the case is. But either way, that'll be something that hopefully will be coming down the pipeline pretty soon here. So again, I'm just going to be playing the audio. I'll have the text pulled up on the screen. It's probably a good idea if the No Fear Shakespeare book um, is helpful and handy to have that out and be looking that, at that at the same time. But remember that you can obviously replay this and move the scrubber back and forth to find the parts that you want. So hopefully it kind of achieves what we were doing in class prior to um, spring break and then the changes in instruction now. All right, so I'm gonna be playing part of an audiobook. I got it from a site called LibriVox. They have an unbelievable number of free audiobooks. Just different people get together to read them um, and do character voices. So highly recommended, not just for this class, but if you're, you know, quarantined, I think um, any sort of media that's new and mind expanding and kind of lets you in your mind leave, you know, your home or what's going on for a few hours is always a good thing. So little plug for where I got the book. Anyways, we'll pick up with Act 3, um, Scene 1. We're only going to go up to about line 180 today just to kind of make this manageable and because I'm still figuring the system out as well, but we will do our best. All right, so I am going to play the audio and then pull up the first page of Act 3 here. Act 3 of A Midsummer Night's Dream This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare Act 3 Scene 1 The Wood Titania lying asleep. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Are we all met? Pet, pet. And here's a marvellous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This hawthorn break our tiring house. And we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Permus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Permus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. I want to see you that. Okay, so one of the first things, and I think we pointed this out in both classes before we left for break, is if you're noticing how bottom sentences have been so far, he's constantly asking questions. And... I think we discussed in class how this is a big shift for the character of Bottom. If we go back to, I think his first appearance is Act 1, Scene 2, um, he's very bossy. We might even call him a bully, ha ha ha. But anyways, he's somebody who has a great deal of confidence and very little actual ability to execute anything with that. He thinks he's the world's greatest actor, but I think we've seen a lot that he probably thinks he's the best at everything and can't quite define what anything is. Either way, we're going to see that in this act particularly, Bottom is probably at its most vulnerable. When he starts speaking with Titania, um, we get a sense that his confidence is really a mask 
if you will, and that Bottom is probably more aware of how foolish he is and maybe dislikes that about himself than he was letting on before. So I think he's one of Shakespeare's most interesting characters in that regard, that he's he's really vulnerable and he's not just an idiot, he's not just a clown, um, he's not just a troublemaker, a knave. Um, he's somebody who seems to be covering up for a lot, like probably a lot of the other characters in this play. I mean, we saw Helena back in Act 1, Scene 1, um, talking about how she was as beautiful as Hermia, and then we saw, by the end of Act 2, Helena totally breaking down and saying that she's as ugly as any of the beasts of the forest. So I think in some ways Bottom's trajectory is similar to that, but we're getting the first inkling that he needs other people to help him out. He's, he's happy to take the lead, but he needs somebody to point him in the right direction at least. And so um, I think it's important that his first really three lines of this act, the climax of the play, are questions rather than commands, like he was giving a lot in Act 1, Scene 2. So... By your Lincoln, a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have devised to make all well. Write me a prologue, and let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed, and, for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we... All right, so if you're hearing a little meowing in the background, that's because Pico came in to help me out here. She's, she's a fan of the play. She's kind of our own bully bottom around the house here. Anyways, um, one of the things that you also want to pick up on is that when Bottom gets cast for the play, some of you put, yes, 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 that's true. When Bottom gets cast for the play, a lot of you pointed out that he's happy to be Pyramus and then asks, what is Pyramus? Um, so at least at this point, it seems as though Bottom has maybe read the play or talked to people. He knows that Pyramus kills himself, and I guess that was already apparent when Quince explains the play to him. But he seems a little more informed than he initially was. However, he doesn't seem as informed about maybe what other people understand about the theater because you'll see in this whole part here, um, he's terrified that people will think the actors on the stage are literally killing one another. And um, particularly in a moment here for the women, um, he's going to say that this is something that's unacceptable and we need to make it understandable for them that we're not killing each other. Um, of course, there's kind of deep layers of irony here. This is being said in a theater. Everybody in the theater, probably if they're not drunk at this point, because a lot of people would drink in 1600 at the Globe, realize that these were actors telling a story, that this wasn't actually Bully Bottom, but one of Shakespeare's acting company up there. And so, um, again, probably a chance for the audience to do a bit of laughing at themselves as much as the characters on the screen here. We'll have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in God shield us, a lion. Among ladies, it's a most dreadful thing, for there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Okay, so another thing to pick up here, and I guess I jumped the gun a bit with talking about how gender comes into it, but Snout brings up that um, the ladies are the ones that we have to worry about. This entire acting company is men, as Shakespeare's own company would have been. Um, but it also seems like they're hiding a bit of their own fears over the play by saying, not I'm scared, but oh, ladies will be scared. And so we have to think of them, certainly not ourselves, but we have to think of them. I think Starveling's line there on line 28, I fear it, I promise you, could be read two ways. One is that ladies will be afraid of the lion. He's afraid that the ladies won't understand that the play is make-believe. But we could also read that I fear it as being the lion. And so I think depending on what kind of actor is playing Starveling and how silly you want to make this scene with what people are talking about, um, saying I fear it could apply either to the situation or actually 
the lion itself. Um, and I think that, that adds, again, a, a layer of kind of comedy, depending on the director that you want to do for this. But the idea of gender in there and the idea of saying, we're doing this for women, um, especially with Lysander Demetrius saying that everything that they're about to go do in Act 3 is for Helena, is kind of an interesting play on that idea that men only act foolish um, because they're trying to protect women in some way, which as a man, I think is patently ridiculous. We do a perfect job at acting foolish with no women in the room. I, try, I promise you that. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he himself must speak through, saying thus, or of the same defect, Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you, not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed let him name his name, and tell them plainly he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so. But there is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber. For you know Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Okay, and so Quince is bringing up additional problems. And one probably wonders at this point if Quince is just trying to talk himself out of this god-awful play. But Quince brings up that in the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, they need moonlight that they're meeting by to see each other. And then he'll also bring up in a moment that they need a wall, and specifically a wall with a chink or a crack in it, so that they can speak to each other through it. Um, almost kind of an ancient version of Love is Blind. I had to make my reality show TV reference. But anyways, um, Quince says, we've still got the problem of the wall, and we've still got the problem of the moonlight. And um, as you notice, if you look up at this part with Snout here, he's starting to get in on the action. Um, Bottom was the first one to suggest that they give a prologue, but it seems to almost be a free-for-all with the actors, and we can see Quince totally losing control of the situation. So it's interesting that Quince says that there are these problems, um, on the one hand, maybe he truly thinks that Bottom is the smartest guy in the room now and wants to know what he thinks. But another way that you could look at it is Quince is trying to say, this is the wrong play to do and maybe we shouldn't do this at all. Doth the moon shine that night we play our play? A calendar, a calendar. Look in the almanac. Find out moonshine, find out moonshine. Yes, it doth shine that night. Why, then may you leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play, open, and the moon may shine in at the casement. I, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lanthorn, and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus and Thisbe, says the story, did talk through the chink of a wall. Okay. And so we see again here that um, there's kind of a bad idea, but if you notice who brings up the bad idea this time, it's actually Quince. Um, Quince is the one to say, well, we can't actually have a window there, even though moonlight should be shining that night. We need to have somebody play moonlight. And so the idea is that somebody comes in holding um, a, a, a branch, and a lantern and telling everybody in the play, oh, I'm, I'm not an actor holding a branch and a lantern, I'm Moonlight, didn't you get that? So we have yet another ridiculous layer on top of the prologue that Bottom's gonna give explaining that nobody's actually killing each other, and then the prologue about the lion that Snug's going to give um, about how he's not actually a lion. But again, Quint seems to almost be throwing himself at the mercy of the idiots around him. And we'll see him, by Act 5, get back to kind of regaining his place as a leader and talking reason, but I think it shows that in the woods where they're rehearsing this, anything is possible, that up is down, black is white, 
Um, and Quince, while he's smart in Athens, becomes an idiot in the woods, and Bottom suddenly is the smartest guy in the room that everybody's looking to to try to solve these problems in their play. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Hmm. Some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster, or some loam, or some rough cast about him to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. Okay, if you notice another thing here, excuse me, Bottom is kind of starting at a normal word, and then we'll reach a little further, and then we'll really, really reach at a certain point. And we'll see him totally lose grip of it with those malapropisms, those words that don't mean what he thinks they mean in just a few moments here. But if you notice in this case, he says plaster, and then he moves to loam, and then he moves to rough cast. And he actually did that earlier on the last page when he's coming up with ideas for what should be said. I would wish you I would request you, or I would entreat you. So Bottom is, I think, showing us that, yeah, he knows some big words, but he doesn't know all of them. And part of the fun of this play is watching him get into trouble when his reach exceeds his grasp on how smart he is around the other actors, and pretty soon Titania in the fairy kingdom. If that may be, then all is well. Come sit down every mother's son and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to his cue. Enter Puck behind. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What, a play toward? I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Okay, so Puck finally shows up, and in some of the other classes where I've taught this, um, there's been a lot of debate over the nature of the fairies. I guess that's kind of a weird conversation to have because they're made up in Shakespeare's mind. But anyways, we see that Puck at least can enter and be invisible, but we also know in a few moments that Puck can um, appear as what he wants to be. And so that just seems to be something that sometimes people get hung up on. If Puck's walking around the stage, can people see him? Shakespeare actually shows in that stage direction that Puck is invisible to the other characters on the stage, but, um, you know, he seems to be able to become visible when it's convenient or funny, and so um, that's kind of my discourse on the metaphysics of the fairy kingdom in Shakespeare for y'all. Oh, by the way, also this hemp and homespuns here, that would just kind of be like, you know, Hicks or... Um, country folk or something like that, which is kind of interesting that Shakespeare trots that out here, um, because, you know, they're from Athens. They're craftspeople. The idea that um, they're kind of these farmers is incorrect. They're certainly not sophisticated. We know that because all of their lines are in prose rather than um, verse, but Puck seems to be pretty kind of, in my opinion, mean-spirited and hitting below the belt in uh, going after, you know, their character as hemp and homespuns, as, as these kind of um, uneducated country people rather than, you know, Theseus, Duke of Athens. Speak, Pyramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savors sweet. Odors, odors. Okay, and there we have one of the cases of malapropism, Odious is kind of something evil or repugnant, um, something very bad. It sounds a lot like the word odors. Odors, of course, would be smells, but um, Pyramus, or Bottom, rather, is going for a word he heard um, rather than a word he knows, and that'll happen a lot. Pay attention to who it happens to, because even though we expect it to happen to Bottom as kind of the biggest idiot of the play, other characters, particularly Quince by the end of the play, will start walking into those. And again, I think it shows not just that magic is possible in making, you know, Lysander fall in love with Helena, but magic is possible in terms of making everybody who lives by reason into people who, you know, will accept things about the world that they would never think possible were they back in Athens going about their normal daily lives. Odors save us sweet. 
so hath thy breath, my dearest as be dear. But hark, a voice, stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. Exit. A stranger paramus than e'er played here. Exit. Must I speak now? I marry must you, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard, and is to come again. Real briefly, the story of Pyramus and Thisbe is pretty messed up. Um, we're only going to get a part of it when we actually see the play performed in Act 5. But what's happening right now is that Pyramus and Thisbe, a lot like Lysander and Hermia, are running away because they have a forbidden love. They can't get married and society deems it, you know, improper. Anyways, they run into the forest and um, agree to meet somewhere. And Pyramus, I believe, first shows up and he doesn't see Thisbe there, so he goes looking for her. Thisbe will be there and um, the lion will come out and the lion will... Um, it's already eaten some other animal, so it's got blood on its jaws. Thisbe leaves, I think, a veil that the lion grabs, um, and the lion gets blood all over the veil, but Thisbe actually escapes. Thisbe's fine. Pyramus comes back, sees the bloody veil, assumes that Thisbe's been killed by this lion. Um, Pyramus stabs himself, kills himself for love, and then Thisbe does the same thing when she returns. Um, kind of a template for Romeo and Juliet in some ways, but again, I think... It walks the super fine line in this play between us laughing and then realizing what we're laughing at and feeling pretty bad and then Shakespeare giving us the next joke and us forgetting how bad we were supposed to feel about what we were just laughing at because we're laughing again. Most radiant pyramus, most lily white of hue, of colour like the red rose and triumph of briar, most brisky juvenile and eke, most lovely dew, as true as true as horse that never yet would tire, I'll meet thee, pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninna's tomb, man. Why, you must not speak that yet. Let your answers to Pyramus. You speak all your parts at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is past. It is never tire. Oh, as true as true is horse that yet would never tire. Re-enter Puck and Bottom with an ass's head. If I were fair, this be, I were only thine. Okay, and so we see the first instance here of Bottom kind of being this Casanova, but not realizing he has the ass's head. Um, this will contrast really deeply in just a moment when Titania falls in love with him, because again, depending on who your director is, Bottom's going to realize he has the head of an ass, or he's not going to realize it. But he seems to be a little shocked, no matter what, that Titania is in love with him in just a moment here. But at this point, he's clearly still somebody who's unaware, and so there's irony in his words there, him trying to sweet-talk Thisbe, um, that he, he looks totally repulsive um, and is this kind of half-horse, half-man, weird, well, I guess not horse, but, you know, kind of this silly centaur that's running around the stage at the moment. Oh, monstrous, oh, strange, we are haunted. Pray, masters, fly, masters, help. Exeunt, quince, snug, flute, snout. And starveling. If you notice here too, there's a um, certain element of connection going on between Bottom and Helena. Um, Bottom comes out and everyone runs away from him and Bottom's going to go through this kind of moment of loneliness where he thinks people are making fun of him, that they're playing a joke on him, almost exactly the same sort of thing that Helena says um, when people start kind of noticing her in the forest. But Again, if you go back to Helena's speech in Act 2, where she's feeling totally dejected and awful about herself and what's been happening with Demetrius, you'll notice that she compares herself to a beast. And so I think Shakespeare's clever in having her give that speech, and then someone who at this point is actually a beast give Helena's speech for her, but not kind of mention that beastly side to it. I'll follow you, I'll lead you about, around, through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire, and neigh, and bark, and grunt, and roar, and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. So those are the lines that I was talking about, where when people get hung up on 
Um, if Puck can be seen, he turns into all these different things, a horse, a dog, um, a pig, a headless bear, a fire. He's got a whole bunch of things he can kind of do to scare people. But again, he, he's not, I think, malicious. Um, this is just kind of a joke for him to freak these guys out and chase them around to make them have a bad day the same way you know, making sure that wives at home trying to churn butter never actually get butter and just kind of waste all their energy trying to churn the milk. Um, he, he's not necessarily an awful person, but he is somebody who, if he decides you're his target, you're probably going to have as bad a day as you can imagine without something truly horrible happening to you. Exit. Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me a feared. Re-enter Snout. Oh, Bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Exit Snout. Re-enter Quince. Bless thee, Bottom. Bless thee. Thou art translated. Okay, and so there's a weird um, element of different reactions going on here. I'd, I'd be interested if anybody wants to publicly comment and say what they think is going on. Snout um, seems pretty shocked and, and maybe a bit afraid, but he really just notes, Thou art changed. What do I see on thee? Um, Quince launches into blessing him. And so whether Quince thinks that this is some element of, you know, devil worship that he got changed or a miracle from God, um, either way, he's, he seems to take it as being at face value, something supernatural he needs to kind of recognize and speak about. Of course, Bottom's understanding none of this because he doesn't understand he's been changed at all. He just thinks that this is a joke um, to make him afraid. It's their knavery. But it, it's interesting that the language is so different and actually pretty um, formal, considering that these are the rude mechanicals, the actors probably without any education, that um, we have Quince saying thou, very kind of King James English going on here, which I don't think we've probably ever seen him break out before. Um, maybe that's just the nature of being shocked and thinking that you're witnessing something supernatural, but I, it also could speak to Quince returning to his roots as maybe the most educated of the group. Exit. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here and I will sing that they shall hear I am not afraid. <coughs> <coughs> the housel cock so black of hue with orange tawny bell, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little co will. <coughs> what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain sun cuckoo grey, whose note full many a man doth mark, and dares not answer nay. Okay, so a little silliness from the voice actors there. I, I notice upon rereading this here that Titania, even though she's supernatural, um, seems to have some sense of the supernatural kingdom outside of fairies. She asks if he's an angel, which clearly is Christian imagery. Um, one thing that I don't really want to get too hung up on here is that Bottom's mentioning a lot of birds here, but the most important one and the one that would have made Shakespeare's audience laugh is the cuckoo. Um, the cuckoo is where we get the word cuckold from um, because cuckoos were birds that would uh, hide their eggs in other birds' nests and other birds would end up raising the cuckoo's eggs as their own. Today, it's a pretty inappropriate term that means a man who is being cheated on by his wife and may even realize it and, you know, not kind of be in a position to do anything about it. But either way, this idea of cuckolding um, will come up a lot, and, and it comes up in quite a few of Shakespeare's plays. But something that's interesting to ask then is, um, who's being cuckolded? And if that's the case, we have a few answers that are possible. The most obvious one in this relationship is that um, Oberon's being cuckolded, that Oberon's wife is now in love with somebody else bottom, 
Um, and that would make Oberon, being Titania's husband, being the king of the fairy kingdom, a cuckold. Um, so it's interesting that, again, life is turned on its head. Part of Oberon's punishment to Titania is actually Oberon punishing himself. But I think we also have different examples of this in a certain way. Um, I mean, we could even look at Lysander and say there's a bit of kind of gender on its head cuckolding taking place, that he's um, cuckolding Hermia, that Hermia thought, you know, Lysander was hers, and now Lysander is chasing um, Helena. But it, it would have been something that probably would have brought up a laugh from 1600s audiences, because um, if you read basically anything written around that time that's kind of bawdy and funny. Um, the idea of horns, which was another sign of cuckolding, or the idea of a cuckoo, comes up pretty frequently. It seemed to be a joke that everybody thought was going to hit the mark with their audience back then. Um, I think to modern audiences, it probably just seems like talk about birds, but, you know, I think in 400 years, we'll probably have jokes that don't land with an audience that far out. For indeed... Who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry, Cuckoo, never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamoured of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Okay. So a few things to note here about Titania's lines when Bottom wakes her up by singing. Um, one is what she says about why she's in love. We saw earlier that there was a funny scene with Lysander and Helena where Lysander is saying, oh, no, 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 Helena, um, the reason I loved Hermia was because I wasn't yet a man and I was thinking with my heart, not with my mind, but now I'm mature and now I'm using reason and that's why I love you. Um, Titania doesn't seem to go kind of quite that far. She says that it's his singing that really kind of got her attention, which um, I think is always a part that directors kind of make funny in the original one that we saw in class, um, the, the movie from the 30s. Um, the actor did a funny job of um, singing that. This actor clearly makes those donkey sounds. So Bottom's not supposed to be a good singer. And I think part of the funniness, again, in that is that um, the things that we love about a person aren't always things that everybody else sees. I think a lot of the times the things that we end up loving most about people we love are things that nobody else sees. And so um, maybe there's a bit of kind of joking, but also some truth into Tanya loving Bottom singing, thinking that Bottom's voice actually is beautiful, even though nobody else in the audience does, because I think that's often how love works. So if you notice another part there, there's um, my eye enthralled to thy shape. We're not going to get into that, but um, if you want to do some scholarly research, um, a lot of scholars have said this play is a little dirtier than anybody is kind of comfortable performing it. Um, but then finally, she says that it's Bottom's virtue that moves her. And um, again, that on the first view, looking at him, noticing, you know, him through her eyes, through her sight, that she loves him. And if we go back, you know, to Lysander talking to Helena, even to Lysander talking to Hermia um, back in Act 1, Scene 1, the idea of love being based on sight um, and everything else just kind of falling into place after that um, seems to be something that Shakespeare's constantly kind of making fun of. The idea that we'll tell ourselves, oh, we love this person because this, this, and that. Um, most of the time, I think, especially kind of with young love, it's probably just physical attraction, and the idea of a personality is at best second to whatever kind of is, is going through a person's head. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbours will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Okay, and so bottom here again, I think, by the middle of this scene, um, becomes really vulnerable. He doesn't think that Titania um, should kind of praise him in such a, an over-the-top way. He thinks that... She's exaggerating how much she loves him. 
Um, and then he goes on to say, though, that you have little reason, and we could take that as maybe a cause of something, but also like logic using the mind. And then he goes on to say, the truth is reason and love keep little company together nowadays. That the truth is reason and love don't go together. That people can give you a hundred reasons why you shouldn't love somebody and that's not going to change your mind probably. Or people could give you a hundred reasons why you should love somebody and generally that's not enough to actually make those feelings take place. So Bottom is ironically in this case probably the character who's talking from Shakespeare's honest point of view the most. It seems like he has the most mature view on what love actually is, even though he's a man with the head of an ass um, telling the fairy queen that she should be in love with somebody else. Um, he goes on to say also that the more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends, he seems to think that, you know, it would be a good thing if reason and love were somehow compatible with one another, but he doesn't seem very optimistic. It seems, again, like Bottom realizes that love and reason kind of go on their own roads, and if those things run parallel, great, but most of the time they don't. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. Okay, and so here, again, we have Titania telling him he's wise and beautiful, and Bottom stopping her and saying, not so neither. Um, so we get a sense that the Bottom that we see among the actors, um, giving that kind of impromptu audition for the part of Pyramus, coming up with all these ideas, that that seems to be, in a sense, kind of a tough front that he puts up, at least in the case with Titania, who, you know, in most productions is pretty beautiful. Um, he, he's telling her that, He's not those things. In a sense, maybe she can do better. And again, I think it's a kind of painful moment, like Helena's talking about how she's as ugly as a beast, where, you know, we want to comfort him and tell him not to just stand up there and give these self-deprecating speeches. It's a moment where this character who is just cracking us up, I think we have a real kind of change of heart for at least in these two lines. And, um, you know, care about him because clearly he's aware of his shortcomings. He's aware that he's not very smart. He's aware that he's not very good looking. He's aware that he's probably not a good actor. But um, for so much of the play, even if he's aware of those things, it probably hurts him so much to realize that he has to act like not only that isn't the case, but that's the opposite of what the case is. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate, the summer still doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore, go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so, that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth and mustard seed. Okay. Um, Titania, I think if she was somebody that we thought kind of had the upper hand in her argument with Oberon, even though she enabled Theseus to do some pretty awful things, um, we, I think we thought that she was the reasonable one, that she was somebody who wanted to be an adult about the situation with the Indian boy. We suddenly realize here, and maybe it's the effects of the love juice, but we suddenly realize here that Titania isn't that different from a lot of other characters, probably Theseus most of all. If you notice what Titania says when Bottom seems to be trying to talk himself out of the situation, she says, out of this wood do not desire to go, Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. Um, literally kind of threatening him, telling him it doesn't matter whether he wants to love her or stay in the forest or not, he will. That's her prerogative, not his. Um, and then I think we get kind of a bit more distressing idea of Titania's love here because she doesn't make her case by saying, oh, I'm a really nice person and I take care of the fairy kingdom and I you know, help out, I, I volunteer, things like that. No, Titania says, um, I'll give thee things. I'll, I'll give you fairy servants. I'll have them fetch jewels. Um, I'll have them press flowers for you to sleep on. It seems as though she's almost trying to kind of buy his 
um, consent for this. And I think that makes her a pretty disturbing character that um, if you're like me and, and thought she was better in Act 2, you have to kind of reconsider at this point. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, she seems to be a lot like Theseus. She's telling somebody that because she loves him, he has no choice anymore. Theseus said the same thing to Hippolyta when the play opens. She's telling Bottom that he that she has a lot in terms of riches, in terms of power, that he'll grow to love. Same thing that Theseus tells Hippolyta, even though Hippolyta, like Bottom, says that she was perfectly happy with the life she had prior to being in this situation. So she seems to almost be taking Theseus's place, and in taking his place, taking all the kind of awful personality traits that Theseus seems to have in terms of not understanding who Hippolyta is and why on earth Hippolyta might want to say and whether or not she gets married and has all the other elements of marriage happen with somebody like Theseus. Enter Peas Blossom, Cobweb, Moth, and Mustard Seed. Ready! And I. And I. And I. Where, Where shall, shall we, we go? go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for night tapers crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes, to have my love to bed and to arise, and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Okay, and just as a final comment here, um, we see Titania again maybe turning into this kind of bad, violent, evil sort of love. If you notice what she tells these different fairies helping her to do, um, she uses some pretty disturbing language. We see that she says steal from the honeybees. Um, crop their wax and thighs, take wax and thighs off of them and light them on fire. So literally kind of dismember these bees so that he can have some light. And finally, pluck the wings from painted butterflies. Um, really violent language, even though it's about flies and bees and um, grapes, green figs and mulberries. I think she ought to strike us at this point as somebody who, if Lysander was changed by love in a pretty good, funny way in how deeply he said he loved Helena, um, Titania, it seems to be bringing out a pretty dark, evil, maybe even violent side. So far, she's told Bottom, you don't have a choice in this. I'll make you happy because I'm rich, and all my fairy minions are going to go out and hurt things to make your life better. So um, pretty disturbing character on that front, even though it's a pretty hilarious scene a lot of times, especially with what the director decides to have the actors do. Um, around the stage and we get minimal stage direction so there's a lot you can come up with to make people laugh anyways we'll stop there with line 180 we're about halfway through act three it's only one scene and um, by the end of this as I believe both of your classes saw in the movie we'll have Demetrius with love juice on his eyes Lysander without love juice um, and you know, we'll be getting back to the world as Oberon wanted it to be. So I hope you guys are having a good one. Thanks for listening to this. I'll try to figure out a way to get you more involved so it's less of me yammering here. And um, hang in there. Stay safe. We got a guest. Hello! All right, all right. Queen Titania, thank you. All right. So yes, I'm that's, Queen Titania. That's, this is Oberon signing off. <laughs> <laughs>